the Lord God Almighty. Make his path God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Israel. Make straight his path in the wilderness. Your name is Jehovah. Your name is Jesus Christ. Your name is Holy Spirit. Let his light shine. Let his light shine in the darkness. My name is David Turner, and I want to welcome you to this week's program, The Gospel is the Power. This week, I want to share a message where we were live in Atlanta. God placed upon my heart. I hope it'll encourage you. It's entitled, God of Mercy. Be blessed. The Holy Bible tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 31, the Bible says, our God is a merciful God. Amen? Yes. Book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 17, the Bible says that God is merciful and He is gracious. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, in both the places you'll see it says that Jesus Christ is our merciful high priest. So since we know that God is merciful, we must understand what is mercy. Mercy is unmerited compassion. Amen? God has the unmerited compassion for you. So how does He give us that compassion, that unmerited compassion. By sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. He was born for us. He walked a sinless life. He died upon the cross. He rose from the dead on the third day, walked the earth for 40 days, and then ascended in the heavens. And the Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 13, that Jesus Christ is seeking the mercy, the unmerited compassion of the Father, so that he might turn us, the unrighteous, into the righteousness of God. Amen? Amen? Oh, the good news for us tonight. It's such good news as James 2.13. It says, the mercy of God, whose name is Jesus Christ, triumphs over all judgment. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done. I want to tell you tonight that when Jesus Christ, when God Almighty sends you His mercy, He will remove every shame from your life. No more shame. It doesn't matter. You might think, oh, you don't know, brother, what I've done and where I've been. But I tell you, even if you're the most bitter of sinners, even if you're a chief sinner, like Zacchaeus in the Bible and like Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, they were the chief sinners. You may be the chief sinner. But no matter what, there is mercy for you. There is mercy for you tonight. Unmerited compassion of God. Hallelujah. When God sends His mercy, He's going to make your face to shine. We're the believers in Jesus. We need not walk around with doom and gloom. We have the hope in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Let's look under the Bible. We see Moses, the life of Moses. In the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verse 12, we see that at the earlier time in Moses' life, he was a murderer. The Bible says in Romans, chapter 9, verse 16, God says, 
I will have the compassion on whom I choose to have the compassion. Not because they willeth or because they runneth, but because of my mercy. Amen? It's because of Jesus that we get the unmerited compassion of God. We see Moses in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. God reveals himself to Moses. He says, I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, God of your forefathers. So he reveals himself to Moses. Then in the book of Exodus, chapter 4, verses 1 to 20, he takes Moses and he turns him into a great leader. And then ultimately, he becomes a friend of God. From a murderer to the friend of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's our God, Jesus Christ. Not only will His mercy save you, the Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 13, it says, whoever so will confess and forsake their sin will obtain the mercy. Amen? Amen. We see Moses not only got the mercy, but God restored him back to the heights and even further than where he had originally been. God fulfilled his plan and purpose through his life. And then God made him a prophet. Moses said, as unto me, meaning like me, God will raise up a prophet from amongst you. He was speaking and foretelling the coming of Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 to 18. So then after this, we see that Moses, he becomes the friend of God. We see this in, in, in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 7. That he becomes a friend of God. And also in Exodus 33, verse 11. Every once in a while, I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to flip the note card. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He became the friend of God. So on one side, God would speak to him face to face as a friend. On the other side, he turns him into a great leader. So we see Moses, he goes up on the mountain. Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. When he comes down, his face is glowing. I tell you tonight, the same way he made Moses' face glow, if you're willing to spend time in the presence of God, your face will glow like Moses because we have the new covenant, which is a better covenant than Moses' time. Amen? Oh, we just have to spend that time in the presence of Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Moses was coming off the mountain with the law. His face had a veil. It was glorious. But if the law, which would condemn us, is glorious, how much greater are we in the season where we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Amen? Amen? We are glorious people. We need to walk in the glory of God. It is available to us. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, not only will He deliver you, because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen? So He will not only deliver you, but when the Spirit of God comes upon you, He will take you from glory to glory. Hallelujah. Is this not wonderful? From a powerful sinner... To a powerful leader, God took Moses. As you've heard said tonight, one of my favorite verses, Romans 2.11, he is not a respecter of persons. What he did for Moses, he will do the same thing in your life. Amen? Hallelujah. What is wrong in your neck? I, yesterday, two days, I've been having a stick stiffness in my neck and it's hard to move okay so show me how far you can move it right now i want to see it okay right to there mm -hmm. you don't see anybody and turn the other way is it the other way is that the way that hurts is well, that as actually, far as you can move actually it? i don't feel it at this time amen already you're not here <laughs> uh, 
Hallelujah. When you're sitting there, you can feel it. Yes, I can. We're going to pray for you as well. I want your neck to be fully released yes. right now. Yes. Amen. Lord Jesus, you're supposed to let me pray first. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you right now for my sister. God, you said Isaiah 65, 24, before we even ask, you answer. While we're still speaking, you hear. God, I thank you that it's already done in the name of Jesus. You, All the infirmity is gone. You, I want you to turn your head fully both ways right now. Hallelujah, all the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell me, you're the microphone. Thank you, Lord. You had pain before you came up? Yes, I did. And now, what is it? Is there? It's gone. Completely gone. It's gone. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. It's gone. Amen. Amen. We see how Moses, he still didn't want to go. He sees, experiences God in the burning bush, but he still doesn't want to go back to Egypt, even though God is telling him to go. Book of Exodus chapter 4 again, verse 1 to 20, God's telling him, Moses, what's that in your hand? A stick, throw it down. He throws it down and it becomes a serpent. God tells him, pick it up by the tail. Why did he say pick it up by the tail? Because the Bible tells us in Colossians 2.15, Jesus Christ already crushed the head of the enemy on our behalf, Amen. He is already at the cross, defeated the enemy from the foundations of the world. He's defeated the enemy. Amen. And he's given us the same authority. He tells us in Mark 16, verse 17 to 20, that we also can pick up the serpents, the scorpions. We will not be hurt. Amen. We must believe and walk in the presence and the glory of God. Amen. His mercy will be all around you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God tells Moses, who still doesn't want to go, he says, put your hand in your bosom. When he takes it out, it's like a leper's hand. He's frightened. God says, put it back in. And he takes it out, and this time it's white as snow. What is the significance here? All of us, our lives, if you look at where we've been, it will look like that leper's hand. We have so much baggage and so much garbage and so much issues behind us. And the enemy is always wanting to bring it up to you. He always wants you to go backwards and he always wants you to walk in fear of your past. Even God is telling Moses to go, but he's making himself an outcast and saying, I don't want to go. But what is God saying to him? I have cleansed you white as snow. Are you having the fear? Even in your life, you may be walking forward, you may be doing new things, walking with Jesus, but yet somehow you've still got Egypt in you. And the fear of the past and the enemy is constantly reminding you of who you were so much that you can't hear who you are of what God is speaking to you. You are the child of the Most High God. You are sons and daughters, John chapter 1, verse 12. We must hear where God is calling us. If you're in that position, the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, Isaiah 43, verse 25, says, no more will he remember your sins. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says, though our sins were as scarlet, he makes us white as snow. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. He says in Psalm 103, verse 11 and 12, I've removed your sin as far as the east is to the west. We must understand. This is the mercy of God whose name is Jesus Christ. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not harm you for a hope and a future. I encourage you, child of God, come unto Jesus Come back to Jesus. Sometimes we're there in word, but we're not always there in spirit. We must fully come and walk in the spirit of our living God. He's looking for true worshipers, that we worship Him in spirit and truth. Amen? We need not have anything phony for the world and try to put on a show. If God says raise our hands, we raise our hands. If He says shout and dance, we shout and dance. 
People ask me, is it okay to do that? I always tell them yes and no. It's the only theology I'll give you tonight. Why is it yes and no? Because if God tells you to do it, it's never wrong. If we're doing it for the sake of impressing people, it's always wrong. Whatever God puts in your heart, if the Ark of the Covenant is here and Jesus Christ is here, then dance before your God, but with an authentic dance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If the Holy Spirit does something in you, it never offends. When man does it, it always offends. Amen? I tell you, I only believe one thing since I saw the miracles of Jesus Christ. I only believe for the real miracles of Jesus. I'm not interested in phoniness, hypocrisy, faking it, pretending. Nobody needs to defend Jesus Christ. He can defend himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not even the healer. I don't know if you thought you were coming to see a healer. Jesus Christ is the healer. My job is to lift your faith and point you to the Word of God because the Word of God is alive and active, Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God speaks. When the Word of God goes forth, 1 Peter 1.12, the Holy Spirit will do the work. Psalm 107.20, He will send His Word and heal you. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who healeth thee, Exodus 15.26. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So you must come unto Jesus. You must come back to Jesus. He will remove your shame. He will make your face to shine. He will make you a leader. He will bless you. Your hope in Jesus Christ will never be put to shame. Amen? When I first experienced the miracles of Jesus Christ, I got to tell you, I just keep it real. When I, when I experienced the miracles and Jesus was telling me to go pray for people, I'd be praying, oh God, heal them, heal them. It wasn't that I cared. It wasn't that I even wanted them necessarily was worried about their problem. I just didn't want to be embarrassed and I was telling him Jesus healed, so I wanted to see Jesus move. Thank God he doesn't leave us where we start. But then, as I knew the power of Jesus, I got so intoxicated with the power of Jesus, someone comes in with crutches and can't walk, and you touch them in the name of Jesus, and they put down their crutches and walk, and it's stunning. Oh, and I love the power of God. But he didn't leave me there. He said to me, David, the healing is not for the sake of the healing. Many people are suffering. It is so that they can see my glory and know that I love them. And as the more I fell in love with Jesus, I fell in love with his people. And now, there's such a supernatural love. I know how much Jesus loves you because when I look at people, you know, people who know me, I'm a, I'm a businessman turned evangelist. I was not a preacher. I never dreamed I would ever preach a word in my life. But when I experienced that first miracle of Jesus Christ, he touched me so radically, I said, my life will never be the same. I've touched the hem of the robe of Jesus Christ. I'm here for one reason and one reason only. Because what God says, I want you to know. I love when God says he heals and so many people have never experienced it. My favorite verse is Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I want you to taste him tonight so that you go back out in the streets and you run around screaming. I've seen people drop their crutches and go running out of the place. I never see them again, but I hear all over they're spreading the word of Jesus. I love to see when Jesus moves. And I hear from pastors after we left, their whole church transformed because they really believed. You say, well, they're in a church. Of course they believe. Well, I got to tell you, then they're all better than me because even when I knew Jesus for 14 years until I was touched by the miracle of Jesus, I, I got scared and I said, thank God I didn't die then because I don't know that I truly believed. But once I knew that I knew that I knew and I touched the hem of the robe of Jesus and I experienced it, I learned something very important. It's not about the healing. You know, we all, if our arm doesn't move, we want to be able to move it. If we can't move our leg or we can't walk right, we want to walk right. If we have cancer, we want to be healed. But it goes beyond that. We have to look past the healing. Why I jump down, and if any of you have seen me or seen our show, I always watch it when they make me watch it to approve it, and I go, who is that guy? I'm so embarrassed. 
But I'm so glad when I'm up here, I don't feel that way. When I'm up here, I'm so excited. Why? Sometimes I'm more excited for someone's healing than they are for their own because they're in shock. But I'm understanding what? I'm understanding that the living God Jesus Christ heard that person's cry, was standing right here on holy ground, and said, I am he who I am, and overcame every obstacle and every circumstance, and touched that person. Hallelujah. Sometimes people are like, oh, that's neat. You know, someone couldn't move and they move. Well, sometimes it feels like I told them gas went down 10 cents. Oh, great. Save some money. You know, we have to understand it's more than the, the healing in their life. People don't always understand miracles and healings. I've never seen a meeting. This is an apologetic not to say God won't do it. We see miracles at every single meeting. I used to say Jesus. I'd pray before every meeting. I'd get on my knees. Oh, Jesus. I'm not like an athlete that has some skills where I can put the ball in the hoop so good night, bad night, I can probably perform. If you don't show up, it's a rain out. There's nothing I can do for anybody. I can't heal anyone. And every meeting I would pray that, and every meeting he would heal people. And we'd see miracles. There was never, there's never been a meeting I haven't seen miracles yet. And sometimes 10, sometimes 20, sometimes 200. But one time I was kneeling down ready to pray, say that, and I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me, David, when you go to the meeting, do you ask your arm to come with you? Do you ask your nose to come with you? From now on, you don't need to ask me to come with you wherever you go, I'm there. Amen? That's the confidence that we have in our God. I know my God is alive. I don't care about anything else. My wife and I, you know what? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. Before I knew Jesus in this way, I, I had a definition. I used to think people who jumped up and down and raised their hands for Jesus, they were those crazy people rolling down aisles. God has such a sense of humor. He's made me now crazier than all of those people. Now I tell people, you know what the definition of a fanatic for Jesus is? Someone who loves Jesus just a little more than you. You know, we don't know what people have been through. I love meeting people all over the world. I've seen so many people standing in faith, believing. In fact, right now, by the way, none of this is the message. We may be here for a while. You know, I heard something the other day. I just want to, you know, I said I wasn't going to speak too much theology, but I want to correct something I hear a lot. I hear people say, oh, you know, it's true. Half of it's true. Apart from faith, we can't please God. We must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder. Yes, we must stand in faith. And that's for the church. We need to stand in faith. And if we don't have the faith, we say, Jesus, help me in my unbelief. I want to see. He's looking for a true heart. We don't have to believe we're spiritual giants when we're not. There are nights where I'm more surprised than anybody when someone's healed. Because I know where I'm at and I'm saying, God, this night I don't feel right in my life and I don't want someone to suffer who needs a touch because of me. Will you do it anyway? He's so gracious and merciful. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. But you know, sometimes people will say, oh, we have to have the faith to be healed. Therefore, if we're not healed, you don't shame on you, you don't have the faith. I want to tell you that is not true. Our God is so merciful. Why do you think he set the bar? All you have to do is believe him and you get into heaven because he knows that's about as far as we could even go. He sets the bar so low because he loves us and he wants us all in heaven. He wants to heal us. He wants to touch us. Yes, it is true. We are supposed to stand in faith and believe, especially if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. But i got to tell you, I've also been at meetings where I've watched someone come for five nights in a row, and they have all the faith in the world, and they're, for, they're first, and they leave last, and they're believing in faith, and they don't see a miracle in that moment, and I know they had faith like anything. At the same token, I'll see someone come in who doesn't even believe Jesus, and they'll walk up out of a wheelchair and get healed. It's because God was trying to show them his power to draw them into the kingdom. All that to say this, we know his promises, we stand on his promises and we believe it. There are different reasons at times why there's healings and there's miracles. God promises healing, he sometimes does miracles. So we will see the miracle of God many times. He encourages a miracle is something instantaneous and out of the bounds of natural law. So someone can't see and their eye opens, it's a miracle. 
But there's also a healing, which sometimes takes an hour, a day, or a week, or a month, or a year. I pray for people sometimes who have a sickness, they're instantly healed, and it's something that's in my body, and some, for some reason I have to wait a year till I see the full manifestation. I tell people we never lie. What we do is we say, Jesus, I'm healed because your word says I'm healed, but I haven't felt the physical manifestation. We always want to give the glory to God. If we can move our arm or if the tumor lump is gone, say it's gone. If not, we don't lie for Jesus. I believe I'm healed. I haven't felt the manifestation yet. Tonight's the night of my miracle. If you don't see it tonight, you be encouraged by those who get their miracles. I never understand people who will say, oh, I'm discouraged, I didn't get my miracle. Well, you had a healing and the devil just ro robbed it from you. What it is is I'm so encouraged because God did it for them, he'll do it for me. Amen. My spiritual father, I love to tell this story. One time, you know, he used to tell me all the time how God gave him a special gift where he could just line people up and say, who wants to? Not even if one leg was shorter than the other, but even who wants to be taller? Line up, he'd mark a mark on the wall and pray, and they'd all grow. And I heard this, and one time someone was talking to me, a Christian person, and they were saying, they're saying to me, I don't know that Jesus heals today. And we were talking about it a little, and I just said to him, too bad, I wish something was wrong with you. If it was, I just pray you'd be healed, we could stop talking about it. And he goes, actually there is, I have back pain. So I pray for him, he's immediately healed of the back pain. His buddy's still talking against healing, but now he's gotten real quiet. But he's thinking, and he tells me, my leg, the reason I have that pain is because one's shorter than the other. I said, lay down. Jesus will grow your leg, and now we don't have to talk about this anymore. He lays down on the ground. I, I'm about to pray for him with power. I'm coming with faith and power. But before I did, silently, I said, oh, Jesus, you're not a respecter of persons. How you use my spiritual father, please do the same thing for me. <laughs> and then I prayed with power, and his leg grew. I didn't even have to open my eyes. The guy who was talking against it, he burst into tears crying. He saw the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Join us next week for the second part of our message from Atlanta entitled, The Mercy of God. Be blessed and have a wonderful week. Begin.